I, I, you, 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 you deserve it. You deserve it. She doesn't, she doesn't protest when I get kicked out of first class. She makes promises she doesn't keep. I was just lucky I was in first class. Okay, um, Yeah, um, can you go ahead and find your spot for me? Yeah. Just kind of make it settle. Try and pull this out of your mouth. Pull what? Pulling out of your head. A beam sticking out of your head. A beam sticking out of my head? Maybe that's been the problem <laughs> all these years. <laughs> Richard Green, uh, G-R-E-E-N-E, -E -E, with an E on the end, and I am a communication strategist and an attorney. Okay. Tell me about the first time you met Princess mm. Diana. Mm. Uh, the first time I met Diana was at the Harbor Club gym where she worked out. Whenever I was in London, I would work out there, and there I was when she walked in, and we just started talking and um, kind of joking with each other. I made a joke about how her trainer was, was being very, very tough on her and she rolled her eyes and she said, yeah, and she pantingly went from one machine to the other. She, she worked out harder than any person I'd ever seen. And then we started talking and she found out what I did and I told her that I had, in fact, even critiqued a speech that she had given um, in New York about six months before that. And she goes, oh, really, what did you think? And I shared, you know, what I had said on television, and really some s tremendous things that she did. Very professional, very poised things that she did. And she said, "Richard, you know, I hate public speaking. I, I'm terrified of it. Could you help me?" And I said, "Yes." And I gave her some some little tips. And um, then I was going off to Italy, and she invited me to come for a lunch uh, to discuss it further at Kensington Palace. And of course, I said yes. And um, that was the beginning of our professional and friendship relationship. What year was this? We met in June of 96, um, just, you know, a, a year and two months before she died. Can I get that again? Okay. Is that because they well, Okay, hold on for one second. I'll just fix a little shadow here. Look straight up for me. Yeah, the rest up for me. One second. What year was that? We, we met in June of 96, uh, about a year and two months before she died. Mm -hmm. Now, a lot of people that I've talked to said that there was just something about Diana that when you first met her, it was this kind of this magnetism that just drew you in. Can you speak to that? She was incredible. Um, she had two sides of herself. One side was this very shy, very vulnerable, very kind of insecure little girl who was not terribly attractive. And then instantly, she, it's like she was infused with this spiritual energy that just beamed out of her body and especially through her eyes so strongly that literally on a couple of occasions I felt like I almost was knocked over by it. And I think that's the essence, that incredible magnetism, that incredible power that came out of her that just hypnotized people through still pictures and through video. Mm -hmm. Did she ever confide in you about this time in her life, 1996, that the divorce had become final? She was going out on her own, doing a lot more charity work. Did she ever confide in you about how she felt at that time? About what? About the divorce, about um, going out on her own, kind of starting anew. Yeah, I mean, she, she was very done with Charles when I met with her, which was just before the divorce became final. And, um, you know, she was really scared and excited about moving on with her life. And, you know, she had a lot of friends who were supporting her. One of them in particular was Paul Burrell, who kept telling her that this was a time for her to be strong and to really go out there and make her mark. And uh, she took his advice, and she clearly did. Some people say, okay, She's a princess. 
she has to do these public engagements. That's her job. Right. Other people say she really cared about her causes. Which was it? Did she really care? Uh, she really cared. I mean, she was a very sensitive, very emotional, very compassionate and passionate person. Uh, and um, she really, yes, it had strate strategic advantage for her to position herself as this you know, queen of charity, but she really felt it and she really genuinely cared about the causes that she was involved in. Did she ever mention why she cared so deeply? Do you think it had anything to do with her lonely childhood, anything to do with maybe a lonely marriage? You know, I think that Diana had a part of her which was very much of the victim. You know, she felt in many respects that she had been victimized, you know, by Charles, by the monarchy, by other circumstances. Um, the British press is ruthless, ruthless, and I think it can easily make someone feel victimized. And I think that gave her a real feeling for what it was like to be the victim of landmines, the victim of AIDS, the victim of other things. And I think there was this natural sympathy and compassion that came from being on the other side of the fence many times in her own life. Speaking of the press, did she ever speak to you about what it was like to have, well, the legitimate press after her and then the paparazzi? What, did she ever speak about those two? She had an interesting philosophy about things, and, and that also ex included the press, which was there were people who were with her, who were on her side, and, and if you weren't with her or on her side, you were against her. And so I think that she had, I mean, she did have a good relationship with a number of people in the press, but I think other than that, she did feel taunted and haunted by it. And, um, but I think she did understand that this was part of her of her dharma, as they said. This is part of her, her role in this life. And, um, you know, she didn't, you know, she, she knew that it came with the territory. Mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit about a typical session or meeting that you would have with her. What, what would happen in a meeting with her? Well, I, the, one of the things that really sticks out in my mind is um, when I went to Kensington Palace and I walked in, I was, of course, a little nervous. And I had talked to everybody to try to get the protocol down because I was meeting her in Kensington Palace and I walked in and she bounds out of her living quarters and looking very smart and uh, comes up and extends her hand and says, oh Richard, I'm so you know, glad you could make it. And I, I bowed and I extended my hand and said, well thank you very much, Your Royal Highness. Because she was still Royal Highness at that point just for another couple of weeks. And she goes, oh Richard, Richard, uh, you know, stop that, call me Diana. And it was just very Californian, very American, very not stiff Queen Elizabeth Royal. And it was very refreshing and it set the tone for everything. And from that point on, very candid. I mean, there were many times during even our initial lunch where I'm thinking, my God, you know, what is she telling me this for? You know, she's just so open. But I think she had a sense of people that she could trust. And if people betrayed that trust, boom, they were gone. You know, so the people who connected with her kind of knew the consequences of not being 100% on her side. And that allowed her to open up to almost everyone she dealt with. But she was very relaxed, very informal, very fun. She loved to, um, to laugh. And she would laugh at a, at a, at a, just in an instant and then get back to being more serious or even being sad, being philosophical. Okay. It was a powerful diaphragm and push. Okay. Yeah, just be a little strong with your voice. Just a tad. Okay. Don't push it <clears throat> the mic is right there. Okay. Yeah. Um, and yeah. Speaking of yeah. the United States and the impact it had on her, do you think it had an influence on her? Did she ever talk to you about she, it? She loved the United States. She just, her, her face just lit up when she would talk about it. And she had just come back at the time that I first met with her from Chicago where Oprah Winfrey and the entire town came out and she, she loved it. She was amazed at how much of a reaction she got. 
and um, she loved the United States. I don't think she would have ever moved here, but she did love it here. What do you think she did for the royals? Oh, I think that she saved the monarchy. I mean, there's very little doubt, because I think what we saw when I was there in London during the funeral and the days preceding that, I think we saw the real British feeling of being fed up with that emotional blockage, that emotional deadness that Queen Elizabeth and Prince Charles and the whole monarchy had been putting forth, and the contrast between the stuffy, stiff upper lip monarchy and Diana, who was so charming and so emotionally free and open, was too much to, to ignore. And so what I think she did is she served notice on Queen Elizabeth and Prince Charles and the whole monarchy that, hey, if you want to stay with the people, if you want to continue to have their support, you need to open up. You need to start behaving like a human being and be emotional. And I think she also, I think so, I think she changed the monarchy by serving notice on them that, hey, this is a new way to be a royal. Be open, be vulnerable, be emotional. And I think she changed or planted a huge seed of change with the British people, allowing them to be open and warm and emotional. I mean, the scene on the day before and the day of her funeral was unbelievable. I had lived in England. I went to school there you know, over back in the 70s. And I had never seen the British people so willing to be vulnerable. We talked, uh, my fiance and I, we talked to um, British policemen, you know, London bobbies, you know, who teared up when they were talking about Diana. There were men, dozens and hundreds and thousands of men, walking through the streets of London with flowers, just in this incredible, sweet emotionality that I had never seen anything near that in, in England for all the time I'd been there. So I think that she changed the monarchy. I think that she changed or planted a seed of change to emotionally open the British people who have been so shut down for so long. And in fact, in our first lunch together, she told me that that was one of the things that she wanted to do. She wanted to have the British people be more Americanized. She didn't use that word, but that was the way I translated it. More emotional, more open, warmer, more spontaneous, more connected with their real feelings. And that was one of the things that she had such a difficult time with Charles about because she just couldn't get, and I think we could all imagine that, Charles to connect with his own emotions. Mm -hmm. So how did she get the title People's Princess? I mean, I know it, it was given to her by someone, but what do you think made her People's Princess? Because she was everything that... <laughs> I, I think Diana deserved the title of the People's Princess because she exhibited so openly, so upfront, Okay. Yeah. I, I think Diana deserved the title of the People's Princess because she exhibited just about every vulnerability and every flaw that human beings have, and it was all in one beautiful package. You know, she was incredibly insecure. She was incredibly vulnerable. She was, um, you know, she had the anorexia. You know, she tried to kill herself. You know, she went through a horrible divorce. She was, uh, you know, all alone by herself on Christmas Eve, which is actually true. I mean, all of these things that you wouldn't expect in a princess, she had it. And so it was almost like she was acting it out on a very high, very public stage for everyone in the, in the world to relate to and to feel better about themselves because, my goodness, if this beautiful woman, if this royal highness, if this princess could have those things go wrong in her life, can be subject to the miseries of, of being vulnerable and being, being unhappy, People felt better about their own plight, and I think that she carried a lot of emotional weight for the rest of the people in the world. And when she died, it was just the gratitude, in fact, that especially women felt for her having done that, being so public about it, and um, it was it was overwhelming. You mentioned specifically women. Um, 
why do you think it is that women could relate to her so much and, and just connect with her? I know uh, a lot of articles said that the women just were like, you know, Diana came out about bulimia. They, they yeah. told their husbands. One of the reasons that we're fascinated, because I, I teach communication courses, and one of the things that allows us to be fascinated by someone when they speak, when they tell, uh, when, when they give a speech, when they're on television, is, is the story. You know, people go on, on The Tonight Show or any other talk show, and they tell stories. Diana's life was this unbelievable story that everybody knew, and everybody was following. Her life was one continuing soap opera, and we were totally captivated by it. And I think that um, she, what, what was the question? What, she Connecting with women, how with the do you think they related to her? She was everything that little girls, from my perspective, have fantasized about being. The crown and the, the wedding dress and the, the, the the royal title and living in a palace and all of that. She was that. She was living that. And she was beautiful. And at the same time, she was just like them. So it's like by watching this story of Diana's life, people could see themselves and they can see their fantasies all wrapped in one package. So it was captivating. There was no way people could not follow this woman's life. Plus the fact that she was magical. She had an ability with her eyes and the smile and the way that she would look at you to mesmerize you. And she could seduce in that way. She could mesmerize men, women, kids, old people, everybody. Did she ever okay. talk? Okay, so now we can start the other side. I just had to let him finish his soundbite. Thank you. Can I have some, some, some water? Um, can we get, Andy, can you get a little bit of water, please? Before? Yeah, for Glass of water. Oh, just just even that ice is fine. Okay. Did she ever talk to you about bulimia? Okay. I didn't ask her about it. Yeah, I'm okay. You're all right. Oh, actually, hold. Let me get a little water. <clears throat> okay. um, how was she as a mother? <laughs> how was she as a mother? She, um, she just glowed when she talked about her kids. You know, I mean, they were really so. They were really her, her anchors. And um, you know, she, she talked about Harry in ways that you talk about a cute little kid. You know, very much of a normal kid kind of way that people would talk about their own kids. But when she talked about William, you know, she got, she got very soft and very kind of soulful and told me that she f felt that he was, in fact, an old soul and that she was very much like she was. That, that, and uh, she told me that, that William was, in her opinion, very much of an old soul and that he was very much like she was. Very sensitive, very, very vulnerable. And I think she felt very protective about him. Can you, can you do that sound bite for me again and just give me a little bit more energy? Uh, a little whis I don't whispery. Enough, I don't have enough level there, but it was a perfect sound bite with it. <laughs> okay. Um, when she would talk about Harry, it would be in little kid terms, you know, very playful, very, very bright, very light. But when she talked about William, um, she would just get almost a little teary eyed and. Uh, very soft, and she said how much of a, an old soul she thought that he was, and that he was very much like her, that he was very sensitive and very vulnerable, and um, she was very protective of him and, and was concerned about him and how he would handle the incredible responsibilities that she had had to handle and that he would be handling even more than that. I was just going to ask you, did she feel that he would have the same crosses to bear as she would? She felt that he would have a difficult time handling the politics, handling the, the challenges, handling the artificialness, as it were, of the role that he was stepping into, because she clearly had some difficulty with that. And the sense that I got about William from her was that, you know, extraordinarily sensitive, extraordinarily sensitive. And, um, you know, she was 
she was concerned and she was also very protective of him and you know didn't um, didn't feel quite honestly which makes sense that the family you know really understood him which makes sense because she never felt that the family understood her did you um, have contact with her when she started seeing Dodi or was this I um, last time I saw her was I think just before or just after she met Dodi or just before she met Dodi right in that, that period of time well, she but we never we never we didn't have any serious conversation about that did she seem happy no, I don't want to talk about Dodi because I don't know. I mean, off the record, I mean, the, the last time I saw her, she was in a bad mood. Okay. So, you know, okay. I, but even if she had been in a great mood, I don't know if it would have been because of Dodi. So. But do you think, I mean, leaving Dodi out of it, in that, at that point in her life, having had the divorce final and kind of... She was, very, she was very excited about stepping into, you know, a new and freer role with every month that passed. She was getting more and more confident. Her speeches, her public pronouncements, her ability to you know, deal with the press and communicate who she was and what she wanted to communicate got better every single time. It was very funny because um, after we started to, to be in touch, um, I saw an old video that showed her in her very first public announcement, her very first public speech as the princess. And she was horrifically bad, and just so. In so in in this first public speech that she gave as a princess, the Princess of Wales, she was horrifically bad. I mean, just awful. So self-conscious, so nervous. I mean, it was just. And so I started to tell her that I had seen that, just in kind of a joking way, to, to tell her how, how much progress she had made. And she goes, Richard, stop. I don't even want to hear about it. Don't talk to me about that time. Because she was very, very, sen she was very sensitive about her sensitivity and her vulnerability and her nervousness. Um, but the, the progress she had made, at, at the progress she had made as a public communicator was, was astounding. I mean, she still was very nervous when she had to stand up and speak and very insecure, but you wouldn't even be able to, to think that it was the same person. So one of my sadnesses about her life being cut as short as it was, one of my sadnesses about her life being cut as short as it was, was that I think within a year or two years, we would have gotten to see the enormous strength that this woman had and seen it when she came out into the public stage. Not just her fashion statements, but her statements about the importance of, of philanthropy and the importance of compassion and giving and, and emotionality. And you know, the England and the United Kingdom and the world lost a great spokesman for the heart. And uh, she was cut off just before she really was about to hit her prime in that way. Where were you when you heard the news of her death? I was here in LA and um, I saw it on a television monitor in a restaurant and I thought that it was some joke. I mean, I, I could not believe it. And I just started shaking and when it became clear that it was real. And I um, called my friend Paul, who was her butler, and uh, you know he had gone to Paris to be with her. And um, you know, then when he came back, you know, I was able to speak to him, and he was shattered and just, just completely shattered, and it's just in, in complete shock. And then um, he invited me to come to the funeral, and um, you know, said that she would have wanted me to come, and and so I immediately made reservations and and flew over there, and I mean, it's just. I have to tell you, though, quite honestly, that having had a conversation about her death with her before she died, I was able to put it in a slightly different context. Um, I had asked her, 
when we had our lunch together, I asked her if she had a sense of her own destiny, of her own purpose for her life. You know, there she was, the most popular, most photographed woman in the world. There she was, you know, the princess of Wales. And I asked her, I said, do you have a sense of what your life purpose is? And she said, absolutely. She said, this, this will be my last lifetime. I'm not coming back. And I said, so I, I imagine that means you believe in reincarnation. Reincarnation, she said, absolutely. And she said, I'm going to accomplish it all this time. I'm going to do everything I need to do, because this is it. Wow. What do you think her legacy is? I think on a practical level, her legacy will be that there will be countless human beings all over the world that will benefit from the money that her charity and charitable causes uh, create. But I think beyond that, you know, this this is not a great place to do an interview. We got to we got to we got to do. It was actually a little bit quieter earlier on. The, the rings are real strong. Okay. They mm -hmm. just like cut you off. I understand. So where do you want me to start? Um, just what her legacy is. I think her legacy, I think on a practical level, the memorial fund is critical. And I disagree very strongly with her brother, uh, you know, the Earl Spencer Charles, uh, who, saying that it should be disbanded. I mean, that's a, that's a huge mistake to stop that. Because she creates a reason for people to think about other people, to think about charitable causes who would never have thought about that. And to feel good giving money in her behalf to keep her legacy alive and to help the causes that she wanted to help. I think that's very important. On an emotional level, I think her legacy will be that she will have changed the monarchy, that Queen Elizabeth and the next royal head of the monarchy, whether it's Charles or William, will now have permission to be emotional will now have permission to be more the, the people's king or the people's queen, which I think is critical if the monarchy is going to continue. It's got to be modern, modernized, and Diana was the person, was the catalyst to do that. On a deeper level, one of the things that Diana so deeply wanted was for the British people to start to be in touch with their feelings. And she wanted you know, Charles to be that way, she wanted Queen Elizabeth to be that way, and she wanted human beings to be more real, to be more open, to be warmer, not to be shut down like the British people have been for so long. So I think her legacy has been, through her funeral and her death and all of the mourning, is that people got a chance to experience that they would still be alive, that they wouldn't perish from the earth if they shed a tear. They wouldn't perish from the earth if they opened their heart a little bit, even though most of them didn't understand. I mean, the bobbies in the street or the guys walking around with flowers at the time of her funeral didn't understand why they were so choked up. That catharsis, that feeling of their hearts and their emotions was incredibly positive for them. Thank you. Oh, did you have more? So I think in a very strange way, the timing of her death was useful in that way. Because had she gone off with Doty or with any other man and established a different life, I think it would have taken her legacy, taken her image, taken her reputation, taken her power in a slightly different direction, Okay, if she had cho chosen to go that way. Um, yeah. I mean, that may in a way be contradictory because I felt that she was growing in her own stature of herself, her own sense of herself, her own confidence. But she was going to have to make a choice. Was she going to use that self-confidence to say no to the royal duties and go off and just have a good time? Or was she, go was she going to focus on being more and more a spokesperson for the things that really made her heart sing? Okay. Okay. I've got a tough one for you. Go ahead.